China Watch Radio is brought to you in part by Sushi Market Sprouts on 7th in Santa Cruz and Kaito in the Capitola Mall Food Court. Treat yourself to the finest Japanese cuisine you'll find anywhere with fresh sushi to go and delicious ramen dinners. Sushi Market Sprouts and Kaito. Yum! Well, today we bring you some of the most important news of the week regarding China and offer our opinions and how that uh, news might affect our lives here in the United States of America. Your host for today's uh, show of China Watch Radio, John T. Collier, Michael Olson, and me, Bill Graff. Ni hao ma. Easy for you to say. Now, uh, I suppose we should hit the ground running with the first item of the day. It's all about food. And when we talk about food at KSCO, we check in with Michael Olson first. Yeah, and we're always talking about food, whether we're talking with Michael Olson or not, because we're always hungry around here. Wasn't well, that the truth? And we're always hungry everywhere when it gets right down to it. And you know, whenever I see something in China relating to food, I pick up because of some of the history of what has happened with respect to food in China. Most notably, of course, the uh, Mao's Great Famine that yes. uh, killed somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 million people. So whenever the government over there does something with food, I pick up and start watching. Before you take off, let me say hi to John T. Collier. How you doing? Uh, very good, thanks, Billy. And it's a pleasure to be here with you both. It is indeed. Uh, you don't right, know Mike. that yet. Well, we always get into a good discussion. That's okay, here we go. So, um, uh, this is out of Weifang in Shandong province. The local social media turned up a video uh, of a, that a peasant shot, a peasant farmer shot as a selfie. And he was talking about how he was given the order to chop down all of his trees. Why? Because the local cadre, the local communist officials, uh, say that we need the, the land to grow grain. We're running short of food. Now, whenever the local cadre makes a drastic move like telling you to go out and chop down all your trees, no doubt... They're trying to please somebody above them in the, you know, Chaicom food chain. So I wonder, <laughs> wh you know, why the panic all of a sudden from this local authority. He must be speaking on behalf of, of uh, the CCP above him. So are, are the, is the Chinese Communist Party freaking out about a lack of food? So um, that's what caught my attention with this video. So the, in the video, the farmer who, who was recording the selfie said, we just received a notice that we are required to cut down these trees and grow grains instead, even if financially it ends up being a loss. Commodity prices are so high nowadays. Fertilizers, pesticides, and prices are ridiculously high. So it was as if he's saying, can't grow grains. And, you know, I can't chop down my trees and grow grains and make any money. It doesn't make any sense to me. But I have to do it anyway. Also featured was a, uh, a village loudspeaker saying that the trees are not allowed to be planted in farmland. And land cannot be used for fish ponds or fruit trees. The trees must be cut down within a limited time frame. Otherwise, they will be forcibly killed by the authorities. <laughs> this is a CCP. A local government official in the province told the Chinese language Epoch Times, even fish ponds must be filled to grow crops uh, anyway. You have to do what the Chinese Communist Party tells you to do. So a Japanese commentator pointed out that most of the soil in Shandong province, province is yellow soil and the area is prone to drought. So removing the trees could easily lead to soil erosion. Mm -hmm. Moreover, the land where the trees had stood will have, have to get a more than average amount of fertilizers and pesticides to be able to produce a good harvest. Peasants will have a hard time making any profit due to the increasing cost of fertilizers and pesticides. So that being the first 
a piece of hard news today, and I think it is significant because it signals something that the CCP itself is is thinking about. Now, there's a couple pieces of information that we have to hold on to whenever we think of China and food. First of all, China hosts about one pretty close to five times as many people as we have here in the United States, maybe four and a half or something like that. A lot of people on one-fifth the arable land. So we have a lot of farmland here. They have very little there. One-fifth of the farmland to support over four times as many people. That's quite a stat. Now, when Deng Xiaoping loosened up the rules in China and everybody ran into the city to build a factory, where did they get the labor? Yeah. From the farmland. Yeah. So all the farm workers ran into town and got a job putting widgets together in the factory. What happened to the farmland? So what they tried to do is industrialize the farmland, right? They tried to um, uh, model what we do here in the West with big tractors and large tracts of land. But they don't have large tracts of land. So what happened in the interim in their attempt to industrialize agriculture in China? An estimated... Twenty uh, percent of Chinese China's farmland and eighty percent of its groundwater are irretrievably contaminated with industrial heavy metals. So, when we look at China, we have we have to see what appears to be a very hungry country. And what do hungry people do? Well, they're desperate. They're desperate, and they look for food, right? So that's news item number one. Olson, with regards to that, um, the best information I've been able to find on that on this is that China currently imports around about twenty percent of their food supply. Uh, if you know, this sounds like another um, uh, kind of gr- a great leap forward, kill the sparrows sort of a, 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 a crazy nonsensical non free market idea. Uh, but, but let's just hypothetically say that uh, that the CCP uh, is uh, is acting to try and uh, close that food supply gap. Uh, to to what degree is that actually possible? Well, that's a good question, and it depends on um, what they have to bring to bear to make it happen. And uh, as I was speaking earlier, much of uh, farmers used to feed China for 4,000 years, right? And the technologies that they used were all land-borne technologies. And locally based. And it's all on farm. Yeah. And it was all right there. Yeah. Mm. There, there were no industrial inputs at all. Nothing for well over 40... Th- uh, 4,000 years, okay? When the CCP took charge, all that ended. They ro- rounded up all of those independent farmers, and they put them on collective farms uh, during Mao's Great Leap Forward, during which, of course, they uh, decided one day to go out and kill all the sparrows, as you brought up earlier, uh, in order to save the grain crops from the sparrows eating it all up. And, of course, sparrows don't eat grain. They don't. They really don't. And and because they don't eat the grain, what ends up happening is you have uh, other pests that that show up because there's there's grain. Yeah. Yeah. And Ooh. and you and you end up with uh, you end up with a huge problem. Uh, my question on this is, and and yeah. the uh, situation you laid out. Uh, by the way, Jonte, that's a very good question. Oh. Very good question. Uh, the, the, my question is this: It seems to me that when China uh, forced all the farmers to move into the cities and work in other areas. It's very much what happened here in the United States. Exactly. Mm-hmm. 
Now, we, we compensated because, as you mentioned, we, we, we had mechanized... We used machines. Highly and mechanized chemicals farms. And, and pesticides. And all so. kinds of stuff oh. we had at our disposal to make up for that. Our farmers became very good. Maybe, well, I, I think I'll just come out and say it. I believe our farmers are the best in the world at what they do. At what they do, yes. They're Which very is good. farming with money instead of time. Mm. And see, the traditional Chinese farmer... Farmed with time right. instead of money. So my question is, how does China transition to the only model that will feed them, which is our model? Well, it has to have the land resources that we have, and it doesn't. So, so it has so to have the wide open they, spaces. Your answer is they can't. It will be very, very difficult. And that, quest, that answer answers your question and, and Jaunty's too. Yes, mm. it does. Yeah. Wow. Well, I'm, you know, we're, we're... A hungry nation. Wow. So bear that in mind when you, when you look at and see what's happening in Ukraine. <laughs> yes. And, that, and, and, and this is a situation where the Ukrainians... Were that area's farmers the breadbasket of of the of Europe? Yeah. yeah. All right, so um, it's my turn, I guess, and and I want to talk a little bit about a company that you may not even have ever heard of. A few of us have heard the, of this company, but for what it does, it's very under the radar. I'm talking about a company called BlackRock. Now, you could argue that BlackRock owns the world. They don't actually own the world, but um, they, they have quite an impact on your life. Um, your debt, um, the cost of things around you, like oil, uh, like food, a whole bunch of stuff like that. Anyway, BlackRock is, um, well, how do I put this? Black it's Rock, a Black, Black Rock. Black Rock is, uh, was started by a fellow named uh, Larry Fink. Lawrence D. Fink is the founder, chairman, and chief executive officer of BlackRock. He and seven partners founded BlackRock in 1988. In 1988. Not that long ago, really, on the grand scheme of things. Now, under this guy's leadership, this company has grown into the global leader in all of investment and technology solutions. They are the best at what they do. They are absolutely the most successful company on the planet. They are in charge of overseeing this number I am going to say is correct. I'm not misstating this. BlackRock oversees $10 trillion worth of commerce. It is easily the largest money manager on the planet Earth. As of December of last year, BlackRock managed $10 trillion of other people's money. By the way, Larry Fink, the guy I told you about, his yearly salary from the company is $24 million. Billion. No, $24 million. Uh, but that, his, his salary isn't... That's no. pocket change for no. what he's worth. He's worth now $1 billion himself. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, here's the thing. How they make their money is they manage other people's money. Mm -hmm. And the reason I'm bringing up Blackhawk at all, Blackrock at all, is, is, is really because something happened recently that people probably haven't heard of yet. Now, now we talk about China and we talk about how insular it is and we talk about how important uh, you know, China is in various things. But one of the things China doesn't apparently do very well, at least not by outside world standards, is they don't manage money very well. So they've decided to do something they've never done before, ever. This past year, they allowed a BlackRock to become the first foreign-owned asset management company based outside of China to receive approval directly from Xi Jinping, 
he, he himself signed the document to start a mutual fund business in China. This all according to the Reuters news service. This is the first time China's allowed anything like this. And the company they chose is the company that's in control of $10 trillion worldwide. Mm -hmm. So I brought this up because, first of all, until a, a, about a year ago, I, I didn't even know this company existed. And I wasn't paying much attention to it after I knew it existed. So I'm sure that the vast majority of people listening to the broadcast today had never heard of this company. They fly very low under the radar. But they have, uh, near as I can tell, according to their own literature on the Internet, 11 divisions. All broken up. Different parts of the planet that certain people are in charge of. Different ways they manage money. Certain divisions and how they manage money. And there are 11 or 12 divisions in this company, and none of them underperform, according to Reuters. This is an amazing company. So I'm, I'm, I'm asking here, with China's agricultural issues going on and their real estate issues going on, and some other stuff I'm going to tell you about later on in the program involving their military uh, expansionism. Um, I would think that BlackRock is putting itself in a very advantageous and unadvantageous position at the same time. Mm -hmm. Well, recently George Soros said Larry Fink is crazy. By putting all of his chips in China. Well, he's not putting all of his chips in China. They well, got a lot of chips elsewhere. And, and furthermore, the chips that he's putting here and there and everywhere aren't his chips. <laughs> That's correct. Are, there are chips, That's right. essentially. That's correct. And the way Larry Fink gets all of our chips is that uh, he, he uh, borrows them, essentially, from the investment companies that we give them to for our retirement funds and whatnot. Okay. Yeah. So <clears throat> that's where all of Larry Fink's money comes from, is from us. Now, and countries around the world, because he does, the, the company uh, uh, BlackRock does deal with a lot of actual countries, in addition to, you know, people and investors right. and other things. Yeah. $10 trillion is a whole lot of zeros yeah. behind a, you know, 10. Yeah, so, um, you know, with respect to uh, Larry Fink and BlackRock, uh, and we look at China and see the miraculous growth of that country. Yes. All those sparkling new buildings, all those magnificent freeways, all of the sparkling new airports, all of the new everything, where do you think that money came from? That's a very good question. That money came from us. What do you think, Jonty? Well, one of the things that I found really telling within that uh, particular um, video that we posted on our website, ChinaWatchRadio.com, under today's Know Before the Show section, um, was the, the description of all of the, the banks <laughs> that are either uh, controlled or partly controlled by BlackRock, by uh, by means of ownership, and it's it's not just U.S. banks; it's every almost every European bank as well. It's uh, it's global. So if you have a controlling share, if if you use ten trillion dollars to purchase a controlling share in the uh, the banks that then each of which manage their own funds, have their own uh, ability to uh, you know influence the way that that uh, that money moves and investments happen. Uh, that really is an extraordinary amount of power. Uh, I wanted to ask you, Billy, um, and this I think will apply later on when we bring up the topic of today's show. Uh, what popular news organizations does BlackRock own a part of? They own a part of um, of most all of them. I mean, I, I mean, I hate to put it that way, but they own a piece of most of the major market news agencies around the world. Um, In 
Including the New York Times. Including the New York Times, including, uh, you know, several broadcast companies that also have... Probably CBS, which was always known as BlackRock. <laughs> and they have uh, a, a piece of uh, uh, the Australian news agencies. Mm -hmm. um, of course, several in, in Asia, just a whole bunch in Asia. Yes. Now, let me ask you the big question that I have in my mind with respect to Larry Fink and BlackRock. Who owns Larry Fink? You, you know, that's a loaded question, but I've got to tell you, I, I think it's the other way around. I don't. I think Larry Fink is now owned by Xi Jinping. And, I, I, and, if, you, and if you were to pick up a copy of Red Handed by Schweizer you would see a whole ch chapter devoted to Larry Fink and BlackRock. And you will see how the CCP captured Larry Fink. Well, and, yeah, okay, that's an interesting they, as observation. As they have so many other people, too. A very interesting observation. Because, I, I can't and, and when you, disagree I mean, with why that. Would, why would uh, George Soros say, Larry, you're crazy. What are you doing? Because mm. that's where the money's going. Larry Fink is taking our money and building China. And why do you think well, it, Xi Jinping He's building a lot of stuff up. around the world, yeah. that's for sure. I, I won't disagree with what you're saying. He's investing a lot of money in China. But when, when you're talking about 10 trillion with a T, yeah. Yeah. Uh, he's investing everywhere, not just in China. Yeah, yeah I don't understand that. I don't, I don't know that... Um, uh, a particularly large sum of BlackRock's money is active in China. Of that ten trillion, I believe it's in the tens of billions. Although uh, that's something that would Red uh, require a lot more investigation on on our collective parts. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Which it sounds like Olson, you have an inside channel. To, I just so. read Red Handed. Okay, uh, well. <laughs> It's as See, simple I, as that. I will freely Easy admit I haven't read that, but I did a I did quite a bunch of research, as you guys know, about uh, Mr. Fink and and this company oh. and the scope, the scope of BlackRock's expansion and the scope of his expansion in China is beyond belief. Okay, well, I I, I don't disagree with you. Yeah. I don't disagree with you. I, I, I find this discussion fascinating so far. I do want to say one thing before we move on here. I discovered a news story late yesterday afternoon, and it took some of my attention away from, from this other thing. Uh, we've talked about, as you guys know, I, I lived in the South Pacific, and, and Olson's been out there quite a bit himself. And, and this is a er, real area of... of uh, Interest for me. Yeah, save that for the next. Six. I'm going to, but okay. I just, I'm, I'm just going to tease it here. Tease it. Okay. There is a, there is a place that China is looking at right now that is just frightening, and I'll leave it at that. All right, Mister, Mister Collier, what do you, what do you got for us? Inflation, de-dollarization, and Russia's ultimate goal for the war, uh, war in Ukraine. Uh, with the byline, was Ukraine only a pawn in the way of Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping's grand ambitions? Um, absolutely fascinating article. John, T, before, before you there, go there, may mm -hmm. I throw a quick question to you? Do you sure. think Xi Jinping and the CCP and, and Vladimir Putin planned this out ahead of time? The, you know, it's a... It's a it's something that I, uh, I wrestle with. There's evidence on both sides, and some of that evidence is actually quite compelling. Um, uh, th there, there were uh, issues with the, the state of, of China's relations with Ukraine such that, um, uh, you know, China's the kind of place where they like to have their act together and they don't like to be uh, appearing as though they have their, their pants around their ankles. And um, when Russia did actually invade Ukraine, there were about 6,000 Chinese citizens in the country, including a fully staffed embassy. Uh, they'd also have very strong uh, relations with Ukraine as well and have really been struggling to get their 
uh, their folks out. Do you uh, think they didn't that, have a neat plan yeah, for evacuating that, their, their personnel? Don't you think that could have been part of their plan? If we leave at, all of our people there, it will look like we're innocent. At the same time, China has been stockpiling food for at least a year now. And the main, uh, I believe the, the biggest um, of global effect of the current situ situation is the upcoming food crisis. Mm -hmm. When we have uh, Macron of France saying we're 12 to 18 months away from a massive famine, uh, it seems that China was somewhat aware that this was going to, uh, going to occur. Uh, and it, boy, it's, this is the real tragedy. You know, you can worry about, I'm, I'm concerned about the people in Ukraine and I'd like, I always would prefer to see not <laughs> nonviolent solutions to problems, B but the, the real violence that's coming is going to be measured in tens and hundreds of millions of people who are starving to death. Uh, they're, already, they're already projecting that there's going to be, as a result of this, uh, um, this, this military adventure, uh, which I, I don't entirely blame on the Russians, and I would be happy to explain why. Um, as a result of this, we're looking at somewhere in the order of 160 million people living at starvation level that otherwise would not have been. Uh, so th those are two arguments on opposite sides indicating a, different, uh, a, a different conclusion with regards to China's complicity. So, so in other words, they may or may not have been planning ahead. I would, I would love to nail that down and be able to say exactly because of this reason, we know that China was uh, planning this ahead of time. It's entirely possible. It's also... Uh, entirely possible that they weren't aware of this and that they and didn't are, think it ahead some, are somewhat compromised by it. they were surprised that, sure. that that Putin went this far this fast uh, irregardless I think this article is uh, I think it's a combination of both you guys I really do <laughs> uh, that's that's okay a, that's a possibility that's head so in both the directions. the plan was deflation or well this this aspect of what's occurring as a result of the invasion of Ukraine may have been a part of the the general strategy agreed to by uh, by by Russia and China, regardless of what provoked it. And that is this concept of de-dollarization. I'll just read a few excerpts from this article that I think are quite telling. What did Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping think Western nations would do in response to Russia's invasion of Ukraine? The United States and the European Union would most likely refuse to join a kinetic war against the world's greatest nuclear power. Therefore, they would be limited to sending military aid, imposing economic sanctions, and at the very most, excluding Russia from the SWIFT financial system. Uh, for those in the audience who aren't familiar with the SWIFT financial system, that is a banking device that has been used to transfer money between various businesses intending to do international trade for the last 40 years. I think it was created in 1976 or 74. Uh, anyways, uh, these types of economic sanctions were predictable because this is exactly how the West responded when Russia took the Crimean Peninsula from Ukraine in 2014. Strategically, Putin chose to invade now, uh, you know, according to this author, because the U.S. and EU would be in incapable of mounting a more serious response at the end of the global long-term debt cycle when their economies faced record high debt levels, the highest inflation in 40 years, and supply chain sh shortages fermented by lockdown policies implemented in response to COVID-19. Boy, do we live in an exciting world. Uh, now, check this out. Here's a few little, little eggs, little gems from this extraordinary article. Again, I invite our audience to visit ChinaWatchRadio.com and take a look at the uh, Know Before the Show article uh, for, for today. Um, in 2015, 90% of China and Russia's bilateral trade settlements were conducted in dollars. By 2020, only 46% of their bilateral transactions were conducted in dollars. While removing Russia from SWIFT will hurt Russia's economy in the short term, it will also serve the purpose of greatly accelerating this process of de-dollarization. Uh, in 2014, Russia launched the system for Transfer of Financial Messages, SPFS, a Russian alternative to SWIFT. In 2015, China launched the Cross-Border Interbank Payment System, uh, CIPS, a Chinese alternative to SWIFT. CIPS processed around 
$12.68 trillion in 2021. That's a 75% increase from 2020. CIPS has about 1,280 financial institutions in 103 countries and regions connected to their system. So when we're, look, when we're having a conversation about, oh, they can't just walk away from the dollar, well, China has been walking away from the dollar since 2015, implementing this alternate system. So which are you still confused? Trillion in trade in 2021. John T, are you still confused as to whether they wait, were or were not planning this ahead of time? Yes, I am, Michael, because as I say, whether the grand strategy is most certainly this process of, of de dollarization, but the invasion of Ukraine is. Uh, it, th that's th that's a, a minor incident in a in a much grander picture. Okay. Wow. Well, there's a first uh, segment of of information that, it, it, when you start digesting it, becomes rather scary. Rather scary. Uh, by the way. Uh, I go back to what you just talked about, Jonty, with the banking system that uh, that they're putting together and whatnot. And then I think back to Mr. Fink. And mm. I think back to the $10 trillion of money that he is advising people on how to spend it. Well, this uh, might be a very interesting segue, Billy, into the main topic of our conversation today because the New York Times recently decided to concede that the, uh, the laptop purportedly belonging to Hunter Biden in fact, does belong to Hunter Biden. <laughs> yes. Yes, indeed. It was, uh, a, it was an interesting conceding, if you think about it. Barry. Because they've been maintaining ever since it came out, that uh, since the laptop was found and put on the table, that it was a just Russian collusion. Uh, well, in the, well, I in believe, the election, Olsen, right? if I could correct the nuance there, that it was quote-unquote, indicative of Russian collusion. Not that there was any evidence that it was, just that this is the sort of thing that we would think would be Russian collusion. Yeah, if the Russians were going to interfere, this is Th what they would do. That's how they do it, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the other interesting thing about the New York Times is that this is not the first time they have pulled a stunt like this on such a scale. And backtracked. On something that they no, were staunch about before. No, they, uh, well, this is the first time they backtracked. But in 1932, the New York T Times received a Pulitzer Prize for its coverage of Stalin's great Holodomor. Now, the Holodomor, for mm. those of you who do not know, was when Stalin deliberately starved somewhere in the neighborhood of 7 million Ukrainian and other nations' farmers to death simply by taking their food away, sending in the army and going house to house taking away their food. Seven million people starved to death. The New York Times sent Walter Kuransky over there to chronicle this event, and he came back with glowing stories about how magnificent Joseph Stalin was in reforming the Soviet Union into this new worker paradise. And so the Pulitzer Prize gave Walter Durante a Pulitzer uh, Prize. And just recently, the Ukraine complained and said, he does, the, the New York Times should give its Pulitzer Prize back. And the New York Times says, the hell with you, we're not giving this back and so kept it for one of the biggest lies on earth. That's the New York Times owns that. It is the paper of record. So, do you want to continue with this story, Jaunty? Um, I'm well, sorry to be so... <laughs> well, sure. You know, the, the main topic for our conversation today, and any of, uh, of our listeners that are subscribed to our newsletter would, would already know that today we're going to talk about uh, what does Hunter Biden's laptop tell us about U.S.-China relations? And why is the New York Times conceding its legitimacy now? After, after all of the rhetoric that it wasn't a legitimate uh, news story. 
That's right. what I, so hold that question, you know, ladies and gentlemen, as in the we back go of your through, mind, yeah, in the this. back of your mind as we go through this story. Why, after all this time, did the New York Times say, "Well, okay, it's true"? Very interesting. So, um, well, where, how did they decide all of this? Uh, evidently, the political came out and did some research and laid, it, laid, its, its, uh, laid its proof on the line. And uh, they tracked the emails and that, that were released from Hunter Biden's laptop. They put them on the table. They tracked back to the people who actually sent those emails. They were authenticated. Everybody authenticated this laptop as being real. And so uh, evidently the laptop was going to be part of an IRS case against Hunter Biden. So it's going to come out sooner or later. Not only, not only the IRS, but uh, as I understand it, as I recall, the National Security Agency also uh, had some dibs on information that supposedly was in that laptop. They, were, they wanted to see uh, if national security might have been compromised by some of the deals that were done. Yes. And what they found on the laptop what they, was it, information that pretty much proved that Hunter Biden was working with members of the CCP and Chinese business community to do deals. Uh, as far back as when, when uh, Joe Biden was vice president, so quite a few, few years ago. I believe one of the oil companies. Back in even before 2012, way back yeah, when. One of the oil companies was involved. So, uh, the figure that comes to my mind that I remember, something like $100 million worth of business. Yeah, well, that was, uh, let's see, uh, it's the Bohai Company. Right. So the role Hunter Biden's company, Bohai, and the transaction began with this oil company. Uh, it was a Chinese mining company. And... Uh, Hunter Biden engineered the purchase from American interests by China of the world's largest cobalt source in the, co in the Congo. So uh, we gave up this cobalt mine, and cobalt, of course, is needed for batteries for electric cars. Well, it's needed for batteries of all kinds. Yes, and so we gave up this cobalt mine to China, and uh, Hunter Biden made a big chunk of money. But you know the real big thing about this to me was that um, that uh, the money, part of the money in these transactions of, of, of Hunter Biden's, part of that money went to the big guy. And the big guy was Joe Biden. He was the vice president at the time. At the time, yeah. So our vice president at the time was engineering these deals in which... Uh, well, but was he? Was his son engineering the deals, or was he? Uh, well, Bob, He got a piece, of course, of the money. I believe, that's, I believe the term is pay-for-play. Yeah, the pay-for-play, exactly. Yeah. Well, uh, Bob Alinsky uh, maintained that all of the deals were approved by uh, Joe Biden. Oh, well, then there's the answer. And, and Bob Alinsky was the guy that Hunter Biden brought in to manage one of his companies. And uh, Bob Alinsky may, he put this on the line uh, a number of years ago. So all of this stuff is just coming out. And it's especially frightening today to know that um, the person... In the, in the White House um, has taken a lot of money from these Chinese businessmen. Mm. And uh, what was it? Schweizer uh, documented that Hunter Biden and family took in $31 million from these Chinese interests, which is Seems like a lot of money That's to me. A lot of money. Yeah. I've got an interesting little factoid with regards to this. Uh, so Hunter Biden has a 10% equity stake in Bohai Harvest, which 
then is a uh, a major investor in uh, Cinepec Group, which is in fact the world's largest oil and gas uh, conglomerate. Cinepec Group and its subsidiaries uh, are there. They produce more carbon dioxide than the entire nation of Canada, and Canada is eleventh in the world in terms of CO two emissions. So. If we're talking about having a green revolution here, if we if we're going to campaign with the Green New Deal, that's a little bit of uh, an inconsistency when your son owns a 10% equity in one of the most CO2 emitting businesses on the face of the earth. You know the the Peter Schweizer, I keep bringing up Peter Schweizer because I'm in the middle of his book and it scares the bleep out of me, this book does. But, uh, but he says the Chinese Communist Party relies to a large degree on a strategy of luring powerful figures in American politics and business to extend its influence and avoid the consequences of its misdeeds. The strategy is to buy off the elites in the United States by giving them lucrative deals and special access to the Chinese markets. Now, what did Xi Jinping give Larry Fink? Well, he gave a pile of, a pile of access so this, is what he gave him. Yeah. Yes, so this capturing the elites involves political figures but also involves corporate executives uh everybody yeah uh in entertainment and news you name it the ability to start a mutual fund business inside china for the first time ever in, ever so like i asked that's you, access er, i asked you earlier who owns larry fink now well once again you know the quick and Easy answer is to say, well, China has their hooks in him. But but here's the thing. He has he is in control now, as of t this morning, $10 trillion worth of business around the world. Yeah. So I, I, I'm not willing to say, and I, I think Jaunty might back me up on this, I don't think I'm willing to say that China controls Larry Fink. China has some some business dealings, substantial business dealings with him, and they're trying to steer him that way, but he's he's got $10 trillion worth of other business around the world. Mm -hmm. So I don't think they're going to control him anytime soon. You know, it's interesting to see uh, who is not controlled. Oh, you know, you, know, I, you, know I, you know who I can say right off the bat? Warren yeah. Buffett. Warren Buffett, by the way, personally is worth $114 billion. And he's now to the point where he's giving it away mm -hmm. to various what charities. Else you, what else do you do with it? Yeah, exactly. But, but, but it does not appear to me, from all I've read about the guy, that, that he's controlled by anybody. He just does what he wants. So Schweizer concludes this this piece on elite capture by saying we're not talking about small sums of money we're talking about deep financial ties whether it's the tens of millions of dollars that the biden family has received from the ccp linked businesses or whether it's billion dollar deals or more th that some firms on wall street or in silicon valley have received so and the interesting thing about once you have your business in China, you don't own anything anymore. Well, see, that is, that is the thing we've, over the and, course and of this program, throughout its existence, yeah. we, have, we have figured out this is true. You don't own anything Not anymore. Not inside China, you don't. Yeah. So, Not inside China, but I do want to note, uh, I'm just trying to find info on exactly how, how large is BlackRock's investment in China. And, and all I can find is something from September 8th, 2021, where they're talking about a $1 billion uh, mutual fund. Uh, so, mm -hmm. so $1 billion out of $10 trillion, um, I don't see BlackRock as being completely beholden to China. Yeah, that's well, that $1 billion, on dollars, of, that one billion of dollars that is probably one little tiny piece of business to them. Now, it would be, if you really want to know how much BlackRock is invested in China, you have to know how much its funds, all of its funds, have invested in China's real estate. For sure. 
Absolutely, that's the way so you have to... So you, and, 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 Jaunty and, found one fund that yeah. was going to open up a... Uh, well, look, uh, for that kind of research to, to be successful will take longer than the scope of this program yeah, today. You, you would have to have a lot of resources then. You'd have to have a, a couple of hundred researchers but just checking the mutual So we funds. have a couple minutes left. What does Hunter Biden's laptop tell us about our relationship with China? Well, I don't know what it says about American relationship with China, but it sh certainly points uh, th the finger at the idea that some of our politicians, and I don't just point the finger at the at the Bidens. No, no. Uh, there, there is a rather prominent fellow who is uh, in leader uh, in leadership roles in his particular political party, who is Mitch married McConnell. married to a oh. Chinese lady who has lots of investments in China. They capture everybody who counts, Billy. It's elite capture. Oh, you've been saying it's this. Le it's LeBron. Everybody from President Joe Biden to LeBron to James. LeBron James. Yeah. The entire NBA. Don't don't single him out. It's the yes. whole NBA. And, and so and most of that Major League Baseball really is what we, the people of the United States, face is that our elites have been captured. By the CCP, I, I, you know, and and we say this, and with some degree of, of of knowledge about how it works, but I would venture to say that I don't think this capture is, is uh, you know, uh, solely the purview of the United States. I think countries around the world have been sure. captured, and I'm going to tell you about that in the next hour. That's right. It, they capture, and it's it, what they do is they look for. The elite. They look for the elite who happen to might look like a weak link in their... Well, no, they do. they can look like strong links. No, no. They can I, look like Larry Fink. Well, what, I, what I'm thinking about is the weak link morally. That's what I'm thinking about. Well, money. Money. Well, no, I like moral arguments, uh, uh, Billy. Uh, uh, you know, I just want to paint a, a slightly alternate picture here, if I may. Um, uh, L Larry Fink said to his investors, his shareholders on Thursday, that the Russian invasion of Ukraine has, in quotes here, put an end to the globalization we have experienced over the last three decades. Uh, this may not be something that's particularly welcome uh, for BlackRock. Uh, this is a company, a global company. Uh, and there's uh, also a, a company that is, uh, has a preponderance of its investments in dollars. Uh, so it's interesting to see that um, that happening while at the same time the New York Times, which is at least in part influenced by uh, ownership on behalf of BlackRock, uh, releasing the, this uh, or c conceding this laptop as, as actual news. Uh, b because this laptop is actual news is going to have, I think, a somewhat predictable uh, effect on the trajectory and um, mandate of this presidency. Uh, so it, it, is, is, is Larry Fink's wholly owned by China? Is he, is he conducting machinations? No, he's not to, wholly owned, he's captured. To limit the ability of the Biden administration to continue with uh, their, um, tra their trajectory towards de-dollarization uh, de and uh, the end of globalization? Or are they trying to throw a wrench into the works and change up the U.S. political structure such that we have something a little more uh, accommodating well, and something that's willing to return to the, the previous global order? Well, on that note, Jaunty, on that question, we'll take our commercial break and end this hour of the program today. Satisfy your hunger with a fresh, prepared, twice-daily grab-and-go sushi you'll find waiting for you at Sushi Market Sprouts, two blocks from the beach at 300 7th Avenue in Santa Cruz. Fresh, delicious, and oh so good. Hello, I'm Junko, and I look forward to serving you at the Sushi Market Sprouts. And for the win... Uh, okay, let's see. Uh, oh, a popular vacation destination in southern Italy, Quilici. <laughs> oh, sorry. Contestant number two, it's up to you. Oh, absolutely. A common name for the endangered East African weaver bird, Quiliki. Uh, no, contestant number three. Quilici. Why, of course. The name for gardening and landscape services in Santa Cruz County. 
Hi, I'm Randy Quilici, owner of Quilici Gardening and Landscaping. It's true, Quilici may be a little hard to pronounce, but it's been a trusted name in the landscape industry since 1982. Call me at 425-5269. I'd love to personally show you some beautiful gardens and landscapes we've created and maintained, and just what we can do for you. And remember, it's Quilici, the name to know for gardening and landscaping services in Santa Cruz County. 425-5269 or at QuilicheGardening.com. Spring is in the air, and that means it's time for... What? Allergies? Easter bunnies? No, Charlie. It's time for electrical safety. Of course. Hello, Charlie Friedman here with Chris Jensen from JM Electric. Spring is the season for safety. That's right, Charlie. Every year, thousands are injured or killed by electricity around the home. But thankfully, we now have incredible technologies today, like arc fault circuit interrupters and tamper-resistant receptacles that can protect you from those electrical fires and shocks. JM Electric is happy to help folks out with a free home assessment to see if any of these devices or our current safe testing services are a good fit for their home. Don't get a free tap dancing lesson from your electrical circuitry. Give my friends at JM Electric a call. They'll come to your home, have an expert look at your electrical systems, and tell you what can be done to make you your home safe, just like they did for my home, and their visit won't cost you a dime. Give JM Electric a call at 422-7819 or visit jmelectric.com or on Facebook and tell them Charlie sent you. At Batteries Plus, we do more than fix phones and tablets. We help our neighbors power their lives. Visit Batteries Plus in-store, curbside, and online to save on boat, RV, and motorcycle batteries. For offer details and limitations, visit batteriesplus.com. Think Local First Radio Show supports our locally owned businesses and governments each week to tell their own story, Saturdays from 2 to 3 p.m. Think Local First is sponsored by Tremonti's Italian Restaurant, located in the Seabride area, and Kiss by an Angel Wines, located in Scotts Valley. Come join Cami Corvin and her hosts each week, Saturday from 2 to 3, on KSCO AM 1080 or KSCO.com. Think Local First, it's the only way to go. We invite you to stay tuned for our second hour of China Watch Radio today, where we'll be talking about some interesting uh, things that have popped up in the news, in addition to what we've already talked about. We also want to uh, steer you to what uh, Jonti uh, put so much work into, and uh, we want you to go to ChinaWatchRadio.com, look at the uh, know, before you, know Before the Show uh, area. It's uh, all the articles we've been talking about and a whole lot more. We invite you to stop by there and check that out. And uh, we will uh, invite you to uh, stay with us for a second hour after we bring you up to date with national news and uh, traffic and weather information. We will be back with more of China Watch Radio for today. This is AM 1080 KSCO Santa Cruz Salinas Monterey. You're listening to China Watch Radio and we'll be... It's Michael Harrison inviting you to join me Fridays at 6 p.m. as we delve into the hottest news stories of the week on the Michael Harrison Wrap, right here on KSCO News Talk 1080 AM, 95.7 FM, 104.1 FM, and 107.9 FM. What do you say we kick off the weekend together, you, me, and the Michael Harrison Wrap? Friday evening, looking for a possible high of 70 degrees. Uh, tonight, partly cloudy. And overnight low, 41 degrees. Friday, we're going to start off a little foggy, but it's going to turn to mostly sunny skies, looking for a high of 71. Saturday, pretty much the same. It'll be partly sunny and a high of 70 degrees expected. And Sunday, a 40% chance of rain, and it's going to cool down to 64 for a high. Other highs around the area today, Watsonville 68, Salinas 69, Monterey 61, San Jose 74, Gilroy 77, and King City 85 degrees. Right now, outside the KSCO studios, it is currently 65 degrees. KSCO News Talk Time now, 3.07, and it is time for the second hour of China Watch Radio. Is brought to you in part by Sushi Market Sprouts on 7th in Santa Cruz and Kaito in the Capitola Mall Food Court. Treat yourself to the finest Japanese cuisine you'll find anywhere with fresh sushi to go and delicious ramen dinners. Sushi Market Sprouts and Kaito. Yum! Welcome. 
Welcome to the second hour of China Watch Radio for today. We bring you some of the most important news of the week regarding China and our opinions on how it might uh, affect our lives and whatnot. Your hosts today are John T. Collier and Michael Olson. Well, ni hao ma hao tong zhe. And me, I'm Bill Graff. And, um, you know, we laid out some pretty heavy information in the first hour. But I got to tell you the truth. I, I think the second hour is going to blow your socks off. And I'll tell you why. Um, we, Because it blew your socks off. It blew off. my socks off pretty badly. Uh, I, uh, you, you know, every once in a while you're on the, uh, you know, you're doing research for something. And you come across a story which you weren't expecting to come across. And I, I so didn't believe this story when I first saw it that I looked up several other places uh, through Google and through DuckDuckGo to find out if this was like a hoax. And it turns out, no, it's not a hoax. Um, folks, I'm, I'm just going to lay this out for you. Apparently, well, there is a little group of islands uh, in the South Pacific called the Solomon Islands. They used to be, they were formerly known as the British Solomon Islands. Um, if you remember from your World War II stories, like in Tales of a Tin Can by Michael Olson, um, there, is a, there is a really well-known place in the Solomon Islands. It's called Guadalcanal. Okay, now you know what I'm talking about. The Solomon Islands are where Guadalcanal Island is. It's uh, near east of uh, Papua New Guinea, and um, it's uh, a fairly non-sequential place. I mean, it's off the coast of of Papua New Guinea. It's near Australia and New Zealand. It's kind of out in the middle of nowhere. But here's the thing. China has made a deal with the Solomon Islands. Um, it's called a security pact. Beijing has uh, closed in on a security pact that would allow Chinese troops to be stationed in the Solomon Islands. Now, this came to light through a leaked draft from a member of the Solomon Islands uh, government. This person is a whistleblower, basically, and leaked the deal before it was completed. But um, this is, this, should this agreement actually take place and happen, it will go through and become very important to the United States of America and to Australia and to Japan and South Korea because this will put a very firm presence of the Chinese military in an area where they they aren't there yet. Hmm. Um, the United States said back in February that uh, it would open an embassy in the Solomon Islands as part of a campaign to counter Chinese influence in the Pacific. Australia has increased its economic activity in the region in recent months, including the island nation of Nauru. Nauru's where a whole lot of phosphate was mined, so much so that they destroyed their own island. But anyway, Nauru uh, uh, has agreed to provide financing for a new airport on that island. Uh, now, let me tell you a little about the Solomon Islands as it exists right now. In the entire country, and it is a sovereign nation... They have a population of 642,000 people. That's it. 642,000 people is like the population of Salinas. <laughs> no, no, I'm kidding. It's bigger than that, but not much. Um, it's a Melanesian island uh, in the South Pacific Ocean, uh, east of Papua New Guinea. Now, here's the thing that about this whole scary story for me that that I don't understand how it happened. A couple of leaders made this deal with China. But if you look at the way the government is set up, the um, chief of state is Queen Elizabeth. 
still. Hmm. He's the chief of state, which means that if you're going to make a military agreement with a country and the chief of state is the Queen of England still, uh, would she not be consulted before this agreement is signed into ink? I, I, I might be wrong about that, but I... It's a very good question, Billy. It, it might be a situation where, um, where were the Queen of England to be consulted, were, were the, uh, or not really the Queen of England, literally, but uh, was the, the UK as a nation consulted with regards to this and they said, no, we don't want to do it, that might actually compromise their relationship with their colony, more so than if they just turn a blind eye to it and pretend that they didn't see this happen. Wow. They have a constitution. Um, and they, they are an independent nation as of the 7th of July, 1978, from the United Kingdom, but they still list their chief of state as the Queen of England. And she has been so since 1952. So, anyway. May, uh, I, jump, may I jump in for a Yes, please, please. Mike Lolson here. Know a little bit about life in the South Pacific, having done quite a bit of um, work in and out of the area. And what I have come to know is that the rule of law is very thin in those places. <laughs> yes, yes, it is. And so they may have a constitution, they may have this, but by and large, the prime minister or the, co or the co country's president changes often. Uh, yeah. Weekly, sometimes. <laughs> uh, and so, if you're a China, and if you want to take a, take a country like this, what you do is you go meet the person who's in charge at the moment, and you make an agreement with them. And you sign a contract that's legal, and you pay them a lot of money, this one person. And who cares what happens to them after that? You have that contract that is enforceable in international law. So you, therefore, have the ability to have your way with that country. Now, why would you go to the Solomon Islands? If you, if you look back to uh, World War II, you see, w when the Japanese wanted to cut off the supply lines from the United States to Australia, they set up a base, a big naval base in Rabaul, which was an island off of uh, the Solomons there. And with that base, they exerted control over most of the sea lanes approaching Australia. And as a matter of fact, they were trying to set up a, an air base on Guadalcanal to permanently extend that reach so that uh, uh, the United States would not be able to communicate with Australia. Now, it appears as though that's exactly what China is doing. Yeah. Uh, it says here, that, uh, Australia expressed alarm at the prospect of one of its closest neighbors falling under more uh, of Beijing's sway uh, after the document circulated, the secret document circulated, uh, suggesting that China and the Solomon Islands were crafting a new security pact. This is very interesting because if you know anything about what's been going on in the Solomon Islands recently, um, they had some upheaval. And uh, under the local... They always have upheaval in the Well, Solomons. no, they, had a, they actually had a bunch of rioting going on. Yeah. And, and so... A labor, a labor uh, fight over a mine, right. I believe. That's, yeah. that's correct. And so who settled it, who, who got everybody to calm down, was the Australian military. Mm -hmm. they, they went because they have an agreement. You know, the, all the little islands They're have security agreements system. with each other. And so Australia said, well, we'll, we'll, we'll help you... Mit, Mediate Settle this. down, everybody. Settle down, everybody. So they said the, the Navy went out there and, and, and Australia sent a peacekeeping force to the Solomon Islands in November to help uh, restore order after violent protests, uh, you know, were taking mm -hmm. place. So basically what it looks like to, to most of the uh, reporters and, and journalists in the area, uh, it looks like China is trying to horn in on Australia's 
military agreements. Well, that's been Australia's sphere, sphere of influence for quite a while. Right, exactly. And why is the area so attractive? Oil. Well, it's also attractive for the same reason that Guam is, is attractive to the United States. It's strategically yes, it's strategically very important. placed, yes, yeah. because and it's right in the control. It controls the access. Right? Shipping lanes. Yeah. Uh, and it also controls um, the sea lanes to Indonesia. Correct. Which is where all the oil right. is, right? And, and here's the thing. Right now, I don't know if you folks know this, but it's sort of common knowledge to anybody who's lived out there. Our, the United States Navy is fairly prominent all over the South Pacific for obvious reasons. Mm -hmm. Which China sees as its lake. That's <laughs> our turf. You're in our turf. Well, that's what they say, yeah. yeah. So is, uh, to me, what's really interesting about this story, Billy, is how it illustrates the whole process of elite capture. So China can go into a place like the Solomons that is essentially... Chaos personified. Well, well, look, let me just explain hey, just a little a bit about... Just a, just, minute, just a minute. They're going into a place that's very, very, very primitive by modern standards. Most of the houses are built with corrugated tin. It's rusting. They're, they're wood frame. Uh, when a typhoon comes through and blows everything away, it takes them about three or four months to build it all back. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not a sophisticated society. No, but it doesn't make any difference. Because you can still find the elite. True. And you can still capture yes. them. And that's exactly what uh, I suspect China has done in the Solomons. They've found the elite. They've captured them with the money or the promise of money. Or and, something and, else. Yeah. It could be anything else. Sure. Or Fang Fang. <laughs> Maybe it was Fang Fang. They used, <laughs> you know, never know. But th that's exactly what they have done. With the elite of our country. No different. None and, at all. And the problem we have with this is this, this alliance that, that it appears to be taking shape is really f going to upset the balance of power in that area and thus around the world. Well, don't you think that's what the game is? No, I... I, I really do think that uh, China and Australia, or China and Russia have this situation worked out pretty good. They have that grand strategy wherein together they can pretty much take over the world. Well, they think they can. They think they can. And I think, I think that uh, well, Russia will make a very good red China for China. Or red uh, or North Korea for China, another pit, pit bull for Ch for China. John T. Olson, their their stated objective is to create a multipolar world, as as opposed to a unipolar world where the United States dominates. Mm -hmm. So to say that their objective is to take over the world, that may very well be the case in the in the instance of China, uh, but. Um, the stated objective is a multipolar world. And, and I think it's, uh, we're doing China bad radio if all we say is the Chinese are trying to capture the elites. Uh, the, the idea but we of do elite too. capture, we the do idea too. of, uh, yeah, exactly, the idea of elite capture dates back at least to the Roman Empire, if not. Yeah, if not it's not a new concept, States. that's for sure. And the United States has engaged in it skillfully. Uh, and the United States has an extraordinary amount of power and influence. Uh, uh, perhaps in part through organizations like BlackRock, mm -hmm. although we've entered into this new era wherein the name of the game has been globalization. So the global entities have been exerting, uh, have been conducting elite capture and exerting all kinds of influence over all of the various different countries of the world while they retain all of the advantages of being international, of not having to be um, tied to any one country and to use all of the tax advantages that that, that, that in, uh, uh, allows them. So do you believe stated objectives? Do you believe chi China when it says our stated objectives are? Or do you believe us 
when we say our stated <laughs> objectives are. I mean, one thing we have learned by following these stories for the last couple of years is that it doesn't seem like anybody's telling the truth. I was just going to say that. You took the words exactly right out of my mouth. Yeah, it depends it, who you're listening right. to and who you want to believe. Gosh. I, uh, right. So, so that's, our, that's our role. Our, our journalistic role is to, is to be... Um, Skeptical uh, is to, of to all be as, of, yeah. as objective as we can with regards to revealing the machinations going on uh, with regards to all of these various different entities. You know, it's 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 the, the reason I bring this story up and, and introduce it into the mix on China Watch Radio today is because I, I you know I I worry that uh, Australia, for instance, who's although it's a fairly big country. And it's you know it's uh, it's done well for itself. It's still vulnerable. It's in a part of the world where you know it's a lot. If you look at Australia from a, a pass of the uh, international it's, space it's, station it's like going an over, egg being sat on by a mother hen. <laughs> it's, China's it's, sitting on an egg, and that's Australia. Well, Australia is mm. a very big country uh, when you look at w when you see space. it from space, right? But but it's around the edge mostly is where the population is and the in, inner part of Australia. I once flew over Australia at night. There it, were three lights. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, exactly. And 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 so you know it's a it's a country that can't easily be defended. I mean, well, I, 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 no, I hate to put it that way. It's not but, that you easy know, to defend. When it. we look at when we look at Taiwan and how extraordinarily difficult it would be for China to invade Taiwan, uh, look then in, uh, where Australia is. Uh, China cannot hit Australia with medium range missiles. Uh, China cannot they sail can, boats down to Australia uh, full of but, full of troops without being extremely ex exposed to twelve supercarrier but, groups. But, but guess that, what? They can launch a missile from the Solomon Islands. Uh, yeah, that's why, it, that's why it's I'm, so scary to me. We have the AUKUS agreement. We have a much stronger uh, military relationship with Japan. Japan has been much more assertive with regards to China than ever before. There's some very interesting things happening with Australia in terms of, of uh, military strategy. One of the things going on is that uh, both China and Russia have an interest in um, Antarctica. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Australia is very close to Antarctica, and Australia de facto um, has some degree of control over a large portion of it. Uh, now, uh, Australia is looking at investing in um, technologies that could be potentially dual use uh, with regards to science, scientific research. Um, they want to do a lot of scientific research all of a sudden in Australia, uh, sorry, in Antarctica, and that scientific research is trying to figure out what the, the Chinese and the Russians are doing there and whether or not it's actually scientific research. So there's, there's some interesting things brewing down there. Uh, I, I, uh, Australia is a very interesting place to keep an eye on. Absolutely. So uh, one other thing just to throw into this whole mix of things, uh, you may have noted in the news, although it has been strangely quiet for how significant I think it is, uh, North Korea has launched a hypersonic cruise missile that uh, went up, I guess, about, uh, well, a bunch of miles straight up and then came down in the sea near Japan. <laughs> so, well, China's doing all this well, uh, Would that stuff. make it a cruise? That doesn't sound like a cruise missile. Well, they, they sent it straight up to test to see how far it would go and then bring it back down, how they can control it. They, they didn't shoot it as far as it could mm -hmm. go, but apparently it can go for a bunch of miles. Well, there you go. Nobody's been paying attention to them. No, and nobody so, has. Yeah, look. So there anyway, um, th th these these two stories, I thought I would what bring... Did, hey, can I ask John T? John T, did you see the, the video of the uh, Boeing 737 oh, yeah, yeah, in yeah. China going down? I heard about it. I didn't see the... The video's frightening. The vi videos, videos. The strangest thing I've ever seen because... The the 737 was diving straight 
down, down into the mm. ground. Much like mm. the plane in Malaysia did a number of years ago when the pilot actually, they found out he committed suicide and killed everybody else on the airplane. But that's the only way of a plane like that will fly straight down is if you push the stick forward. If you let go of the yeah, stick, it'll fly level. Because it's trimmed out. Because yeah. you, have to ha you have to be standing on that stick, stick to push it down that to hard. To push it down that hard. It doesn't make any sense at all. Yeah. Mm. So. I'm always suspicious of a, of a large passenger airplane going down. I'm always curious who was aboard. Yep. What was their uh, what were their dealings in various uh, international business, um, politics, etc.? Uh, I just don't trust it. it it's very I, I, those things should be pretty darn safe. Well, they did find the black box, but they're not going to reveal the contents. They, they didn't. They haven't uh, said yeah. 150 See, years. <laughs> they haven't <laughs> said which one it right. is either. Whether it's the cockpit voice recorder or the actual you know uh, recording device for the for the mechanical part yeah. of the airplane. Well, something like that that dives straight into it, it the said ground. It was pretty beat up. Yeah, it must have been going Mach mm. four when it mm. hit the ground. Yeah, Boom. well, they have found only parts. Look, guys, so, I'd love to return for just a, a moment to the the main topic of today's conversation, if I could. There was an article I wanted to draw everyone's attention to, um, which I found absolutely just full of Easter eggs. Absolutely fascinating. And in terms of um, uh, folks, uh, I had a good friend ask me today, you know, what the heck is really going on in this uh, this whole Ukraine situation? And it uh, it uh, really uh, unpacks a lot of things there. Um, again, this is with regards to Hunter Biden and the contents of his laptops. Uh, how one Ukrainian billionaire funded Hunter Biden, President Zelensky, and the neo-Nazi Azov Battalion. Uh, now, this article goes through a, a, a whole bunch of really interesting detail with regards to the character Ihor Kolomozsky, dear God, if I'm saying that right, um, who, uh, who has been a, a, a close relation of the Biden family for, for some time now. Um, and uh, I mean, I think they actually might be on the off because I think that, that Biden has frozen some of his assets in the U.S. Now, he's... He was the guy in control of Burisma. Uh, w w for those who don't know, that's the Ukrainian oil and gas company that was paying Hunter Biden uh, originally about $80,000 a month as a, uh, as a member of the board of directors, much more than anybody else on the board of directors was getting paid, mind you, and also having absolutely no experience in the oil and gas industry. Uh, they, they, cut his, um, they cut Hunter's uh, salary in half, by the way, when... Um, uh, Biden was Joe Biden was no longer vice president, um, so th that's the sort of relationship that they have with this interesting character who's got his his uh, fingers in all sorts of aspects of what's now happening in the Ukraine. Um, what I found Which character particularly does? Um, Ihor Kolomozsky. Oh, okay. And there, now, and by extension, Biden, right? Right. Now, uh, there's um, a text thread between Hunter and Haley Biden, his brother's widow that he was dating or whatever was going on there. Um, he says some things that are really strange in this text message. I'll just tell you three of them. One is, it's just something along the lines of, do you believe that I had, quote unquote, children burned alive in Dantes, quote unquote, children killed in Dantes, Ukraine, trying to clarify here. And then he also says, quote unquote, that I had people murdered in Beijing. So it, and it's, that's referring no, to Tiananmen Square. There's no no that would be uh, much more recent, I believe. Uh, but but it's uh, I, I mean it it really it just hints at something. There's no real news there. There's no real evidence other than. Uh, well, he's asking her if she uh, believed that these things took place. Right, right. But, wh but why would he be concerned about that belief? There you go. Uh, now, the very interesting thing about this whole thing, about Hunter Biden's laptop computer, number one, above all else to me, was why did he leave it behind? <laughs> you okay, know, what, why would he have a computer with all that stuff on it in the first place? Yes, that, that to me is question number one. And he was called and told repeatedly to come get your computer. And he never did. 
Why did he leave it behind? Beyond that, uh, it seems like uh, P Vice President Joe Biden's portfolio included Ukraine and China. Am I wrong? I think I'm right. You mean with regards to his... Uh, his, his vice his, presidency. Yeah, his focus as a vice president. Yeah, right. Okay, Joe, your job is Ukraine and China. Well, and to be the vote And, and it necessary. seems like whatever happened, we're in a big mess in both mm. of those places. Am I wrong? Yeah. Hmm. No, well, you're not I, wrong. I read some r really interesting stuff about Obama um, interviews with Obama regarding Ukraine, where he was saying we really should not provoke a war with Russia there. That would be a bad idea, um, and and just sort of suggesting that it's not really worth it to us to defend this this uh, backwater of of Europe. Uh, it so sounds we, like Tucker Carlson. We shouldn't get involved. He was he was saying back in um, yeah. in the something like 2016, even though the U.S. was quite clearly involved at that point in time. Uh, you know, anyways, well, you know, so what, what, why what it's what happened? What what was it that Joe Biden went over to these two countries to do? Well, I mean, what what was his job as as vice president to to uh, now we're in a huge mess in both places. Mm. Well, actually, Biden didn't go there. His son did. No. No? No. Uh, I know Biden went to China. And I know that, that Biden went to uh, Ukraine because he told those people in Ukraine... Mm. Remember that... Uh, oh, you mean while he was vice president? Yeah. Oh, okay. Remember... Right. remember uh, the the president of the Ukraine was really was going after Burisma for corruption. Right. That's right. 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 He he wanted to uh, put and, in a cor a corruption czar that was going to go after Burisma. And yes, and Biden and, said, "You're not getting the billion dollar loan." That's if, right. You, if, if you, you don't fire this district attorney, I'm not going to give you a billion dollars, and I'm leaving yeah. in six hours. And right. if you don't fire the guy in six hours, you don't get the billion dollars. And remember, mm -hmm. he told somebody, and I don't know, it was NPR or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. He told them this story on live te on television. Yeah. yeah, I remember. It was magnificent. And what do you think they did with that GD guy? They fired him, by God. Mm. And right, so, sure um, boy, how did things get to be such a mess? And, and, and you know, we look at the situation that we're in now. And then we look at this development in the Solomon Islands, yeah. And, and I'm and I'm thinking, if it goes real bad in the Solomon Islands, it's going to make the Ukraine thing look like a Sunday picnic. Well, this Ukraine thing, it doesn't look like a Sunday picnic to me. I mean, it it this thing could get really ugly uh, if if. Uh, Vladimir doesn't win this war. He's going to do something really stupid. 12, 13,000 troops, Soviet troops, are gone because they didn't execute well. Well, we have to be very careful with these numbers. They're all over the map. We're in full disinformation mode. So our numbers and their numbers are vastly different. Uh, right now, they're having a very successful campaign and achieving all of their objectives. Over here in the United States, in terms of our media, that's an absolute mess. It's a total failure. Their limbs are falling off from frostbite. Well, we do know we do know that an unusual circumstance has happened during this uh, this military campaign by the Russians. We do know mm -hmm. that six or seven of their generals have been killed during combat and if you if you know how an army's run generals almost never get killed in modern warfare it almost never happens so how does how does china see what's happening 
in Ukraine. Well, as it turns out, I have a story about that. Pressed into choosing sides on the Ukraine, China trade favors the West. Well, this wait story a minute. From is that a stated objective? No, this is a this is a uh, a business story reported. I believe this one is from the Reuters news service. Yeah, well, who are they quoting? Well, U.S. President Joe Biden's warning of consequences for any aid China may give Russian uh, Russia's uh, Ukraine war effort uh, aims to force Chinese President Xi Jinping to choose a long-standing lucrative trade relationship with the West over a growing strategic partnership. With Moscow. Who said that? Who said? Reuters said that. Okay. So based on trade flows... What did, what did Xi Jinping tell Joe Biden when they sat together in their teleconference? Do we know? We don't know, do we? Yes, we did. What, he, what uh, Xi Jinping told Joe Biden was... Let he who put the bell on the tiger's neck remove it. Which is to say, you made this mess, you clean it up. So did we? Did we so, make the mess? So if he said that... and did, if, I think there's substantial evidence that we played a role in making the mess. Um, yeah, I wouldn't... I wouldn't so what would that be? That. Well, I mean, I'm... Very, It'll be very difficult to find that evidence on uh, any news organization that's funded by BlackRock. But uh, again, that's why that's why I invite right people back to, go to our to, lead story here, right? To, to go to ChinaWatchRadio.com and take a look at the No Before the Show articles because you will find some extraordinary evidence on there about the U.S.'s involvement in Ukraine, in particular the article I just. Mentioned a, mid a minute ago about the, the billionaire uh, um, Ihor Kolomoski. Uh, but let me just paint a picture for you that you won't hear in our contemporary media. There are hard, very far right uh, military, uh, uh, paramilitary groups in eastern Ukraine. Uh, they have been um, uh, very nationalist. They are, many of them are outwardly Nazi, not neo Nazi. They're like, we are Nazi. We remember when the Nazis occupied Ukraine. We want to return back to that occupation. And we want to get these, and we want to get anybody who's pro Russian or Russian speaking the heck out of here, which is about half the country. Well, wait a so, minute, wait a minute. That relates a lot to what happened in 1932. Absolutely does. Be because when uh, Stalin. Starry, starry, starry yeah, when farmers. Stalin went into Ukraine, it starved everybody out. And yeah. the. And the Nazis invaded uh, the air, Ukraine. They were grateful to mm -hmm. get rid of the of the communists. That's right. They loved and the commun. They loved the Nazis. You, so there is some yeah. reason to to understand why they would be grateful uh, for the Nazis and to hate right. the thought of the Russians coming back to do what they did before, which it appears to be exactly what they're going to do. Bingo, Michael. So while everybody is engaged with the story that started on February 24th, the actual story here started a heck of a lot uh, longer ago. The, the U.S. at the end of the Second World War used influence to uh, exempt the Ukrainian folks who were engaged with uh, uh, the, the SS to uh, uh, exempt them from the Nuremberg trials. So, yes, this goes way back, and it's more complex than, you know, Putin's bad. So, so let me just paint the picture of, of Russia's invasion. For the, for the last um, eight years, there has been a, a dispute over these breakaway regions in the Donbass. Uh, during that dispute, there, there like was... Like there was in the Crimea? Yeah, well, I mean, the, the Crimea was vastly majority Russian. They voted ninety percent in a story referendum then, yeah. to join okay. Russia. It's it, well, the, they weren't. Yes, and actually, the Ukrainians were turning off their electricity and blocking their water in Crimea. But that's another thing. Um, so there's there's artillery in an artillery duel, essentially, uh, in this Donbass region, where the breakaway folks are outnumbered, and they are getting shelled. Uh, when the UN went to go and see, like, who's shelling who? We know that there's people getting shelled. The UN went and did a report, and they found that over 
of the civilian casualties were in the breakaway region. Now, at the moment that Putin decided to invade, there, were, there was a major uptick in shelling. So just imagine, if you will, that you have folks who are either Russian or speak Russian or would like to be closer to Russia in these breakaway regions. They've been uh, chased there by various violent activity on the part of these uh, Nazi paramilitary groups. Amen. And they are now raining shells down on the civilians. At what point in time would you decide enough's enough and send in the tanks to put an end to it? Mm -hmm. So well, there's a, that's what that's, that's what they always do. Story. That's how they always start a war. History you know? has so, a chance of which, repeating itself which, often. Which begs the question: Did the uh, when we talk about did China know this was going to happen? Mm -hmm. Did the did the Biden administration know this was going to happen as well? Were there interests in the U.S. who are well served? by this whole escapade? Well, and that's been, you know, what we're trying to come to grips with here because when we see all of these stories coming across the board, we pick them up. We first thing we do is, who wrote this? Where did it, what's where, the where source? Where did it come from? Yeah, what's the source here? Right, and, right. And uh, what is it that they're saying? Uh, does it seem like it's really news? You know, the, uh, the, the one piece of news that I took as real news today was the mm. social media piece that came out of Shandong province about the farmer who was told to cut down his trees. Mm. Because the, <laughs> the farmer had a cell phone there and he took a video of it. And he, and he posted it and said, they're telling us to t without, without any explanation... Mm. He just said, they're telling us to chop down the trees. Well, you know, one of the things that you, ne that you never made clear and that I still don't understand is what kind of trees? Were they food trees, like apples and oranges? No, no, no they were not. You, you, they were forest you can, trees. You can you know, see it in the video. They've mostly been planted in order to harvest for... Perhaps like a, wood or whatnot. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But no fruit trees... No trees, trees, no fish mm. ponds, Could, no nothing. Yeah, the reason the reason I asked, mm. and 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 you obviously are about you you know what I'm going to say, you know, in the rows of of most fruit trees, you could plant other crops and not destroy the the fruit crop. You know, you can you can plant row crops of other kinds of stuff in between where the trees are planted if they're f fruit trees. You know, and utilize the same sort of irrigation and the rest of it. You, you know, you can make it work. I'm going to be a horrible journalist here because I should cite a source and I should get my facts straight. Uh, but there, there's something that I need to follow up on wherein, uh, you know how we've been talking about how China's stockpiling massive amounts of, uh, grain. of grain in particular. Yeah. Um, Over half then, the world's grain is in storage in China. Well, that's actually interesting because there is, uh, as we know, an awful lot of corruption in their system. And in one of the regions, and this is why I say I'm sorry, I don't have all my facts together. In one of the regions, there was an attempt to audit the actual grain, uh, the, the grain stocks. And, um, and I'm not sure I fully understand it, but shortly thereafter, something like 78 silos caught fire. Well... Let, let's talk about storing grain for just a moment. This is something Great I have. silos catch fire. Yes, yes, there is, there is, <laughs> and uh, blow up. Yes, they do. They're, they're. It's very dangerous, particularly if any of the storage material is the slightly bit damp. Uh, something I know something about. I, gr I grew up in a farming. I had the job once of cleaning out. Yeah. The yeah. fermented barley yeah. from the bottom of a grain silo. Uh, that's not so, good. It's no well, fun at is all. There, uh, what I'm, what I'm so suggesting here is there, is there is perhaps a, shelf a scenario there where... There is a shelf life on grain yeah. storage. Yeah. Very yeah. definitely. So you Sorry. can't store grain for years and years and years. It won't work. It'll rot, and then it'll ferment, and then it'll explode. I, I, I do want to indicate that there's a possibility uh, that... Uh, they don't have that, what they say they have. That, that uh, in a certain scenario, in a certain political scenario, wherein um, there's a lot of corruption going on and things that you're supposed to have you might not actually have, there might also be a high potential for grain silos that are completely empty, that are supposed to be full, oh. to catch fire. Mm -hmm. 
Amen. They don't have what they say they have because it's corrupt, corrupt, sure. corrupt. And and also they might they might have what they say they have, but it might be so old as to not be usable or even dangerous. Yeah. I like to tell the story about the burglary ring in China that specializes in robbing CCP officials. Now, why would you do that? Why would you specialize in robbing CCC why, well, I can answer officials. that with a simple well, just question. A sec. So what they do is they break into the CCP officials' home. Why their home? Because that's where they have to stash their, the dollars. Remember, they asked, I believe it was Jesse James, why do you rob banks? That's and he said, the, that's where the money is. Yep. So the CCP officials store all their graft money, their bribes and whatnot, in dollar bills and renminbi, and they keep it in their house. So you can rob their house and take their money. And they can't call the police. And they can't call the police. So it's very clever. Why, why? Why are you robbing their house? Well, because yeah. that's where the money is. And where do uh, where do corrupt U.S. officials store their ill-gotten gains? Is it shares in BlackRock? By any there chance? you go. Or there the, you go. Or the Cayman so, Islands. So we have a few minutes right. left. Where does all of this take us? What does what does Hunter Biden's laptop tell us about our relationship with China? I have a question. They sort of I asked relate. the first question. Well, I, my question is going to relate to your question. Where is the laptop, and who has access it's, to it? Well, right there now? are there are very clever computer repairman made several copies. Uh, one he gave to the FBI. One he gave to. Um, uh, who's is, is the, it the justice department? Yeah, no, he gave it to Homeland Security? No, who's the uh, the the former governor of or the former mayor of New York City, Rudy Giuliani. He gave one to Rudy Giuliani who mm -hmm. gave it to the justice department. Uh so And then the, he gave a copy back to Hunter Biden. Uh I don't know. I don't think so. No. Uh and then uh, I would bet a billion dollars he kept a copy or two or three himself. At least I, one. You know, I, would you not have... I mean, if... Would you <laughs> fess up, Billy? You would have, too. And you would have, it's too, John It's in right? a safety deposit box somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Right, exactly. Uh, so, the, this laptop is everywhere. Uh, mm. And the emails are being used. That's part of how Peter Schweizer is able to tell his story is he have he has all of this documentation from hunter biden mm. hunter Bi and you know i think this is one of those historically magnificent stories that is in some respects so deeply sad right i, I mean right. it is so sad well, where do you see the Biden administration going if this becomes a accepted story, if uh, as various uh, charges get pressed against Hunter Biden? It's uh, not how, just how against Hunter Biden. It's against Joe Biden. Mm, mm, that's true. He could very well see impeachment hearings, couldn't he? Now, there we go. I'm wondering if this wasn't the first shot across Joe Biden's bow. Right. to get rid of them. So did did BlackRock and friends look at the situation and say, gosh, yeah. you guys are really blowing it. Uh, you know, our investments are hurting here. Uh, we got to move along. Things are looking weird. So, we got to get the next clown show in here. So yeah. you guys, uh, we're going to start, you know, pa start packing your stuff. The world forward. Yeah. You know what that means? The United States could get its first burnt umber president. Excuse me? Right. Well, I think that Earth that's... Umber. A, it's uh, what happens it, when you mix is, yellow and brown. Is oh. Kamala actually uh, Joe Biden's insurance policy? You can't get rid of me because then she's going to be the president. Um, her, uh, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't mean to be too political here, but I think that there's evidence with regards to her, her public appearances wherein she's relying on the... Uh, 
the her her a Polish counterpart to ask a question about American inflation and things of that nature that indicated that she might not be the most competent person for a, a role of that stature. Well, oh, ladies and gentlemen, look, she wouldn't be the first. Remember Dan Quayle? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I rest my there case. You, go. you know, do, not I, Dan Quayle. Dan Quayle was was not that bad. He wasn't that bad, but no, he, wasn't he wasn't that, that good bad. either. He wasn't that good either. He wasn't that bad. I, I mean, he had, had a gas. He never. He certainly never won the press. Uh, no, to no, the right. to on the either, extent that Kamala, ha Kamala Harris has. Yeah. I yeah, mean, he, Kamala Harris still has the press on her side. Hmm. And if she didn't, boy, that would be yeah, terrifying. Well, it well you know, I, look, I, w we have no shortage of instances in this country where we have elected people to public office that probably shouldn't have been elected to public office. Right, let me just put it that way. Yeah. So what, do you, what does it say? What is Hunter Biden's laptop? To me... It says that I'm afraid that our president has been captured by the CCP. Well, it certainly indicates that uh, compromise is possible. That I mean, once again, I'll, right? You know, I don't know if I'm going to go ahead and point the finger at anybody to be for 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 you know, uh, well, a son's deeds. So no, it, it was his deed too. He he got the money. He was in yeah. on the deal. He that's what Hunter Biden's laptop proved, is that the big guy was making the decisions. Bobolinsky put it right there on the table. I wonder if you went back to the fall of Rome and you discovered that the uh, <laughs> many of the uh, the emperors or senators right towards the end there were taking bribes from the Ostrogoths. You know. Sure. Oh, uh, John T., do you want to take a phone call or two? Um, we don't have a lot of time. But yeah, sure. We only have one minute. We, we got, I, we'll we got. take one call. Quick. Who's been on the longest? That would be Mike in Santa Cruz. Let's take his call. Mike, you're on uh, KSCO and China Watch Radio. Hello, Mike. You there? He's, oh, he's been waiting so long. Why is the phone bank not lit? It was lit a moment ago. Well, it appears as though I can't take phone calls because the phone bank <laughs> well, is not lit. In that case, let me just take a quick moment to mention that I, um, during the break, I added a new section to our website, ChinaWatchRadio.com, called Goodreads. Ooh, and right yeah. at the top is Red Handed, How American Elites Get Rich Helping China Win. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, get a copy of Red Handed by Peter Schweizer. Read huh. it, listen to it. Um, C can I say this? After all you've said about this book, yeah. I don't know if I want to read it. It too, sounds too scary. It is scary. That's what <laughs> Peter Schweizer said. This is the most scary thing that he's ever seen. That's what mm. the writer of this book said. And and having gone partway through it, I got to agree with him. It's <laughs> scary, scary, scary. All right, let's take our last break and we'll come back and wrap today's program up for you. Satisfy your hunger right now with the delicious ramen and sushi you'll find waiting for you at Kaito. Easy in and out location in the Capitola Mall food court. Special orders welcome. Fresh, delicious, and oh so good. This is Koji. I'm looking forward to seeing you at my restaurant, Kaito. Low, dig, haul, lift. The versatile Kubota BX Series subcompact tractor does it all. Switching attachments is simple, and a smooth hydrostatic transmission makes for easy operation. The Kubota BX Series, the number one selling subcompact tractor in the U.S. for over 10 years. Talk to your local Kubota dealer today to schedule a demo. Go to KubotaUSA.com for full disclaimer. CNN Tractors in Watsonville and Paso Robles makes it so easy to get a Kubota. Give us your tough jobs. Coast Paper and Supply is a local family-owned business for over 60 years and continues to be the one-stop local supply source for supplies needed for businesses large and small, school districts, special events, or for your home. They specialize in paper towels, toilet and facial tissue, retail packaging and supplies, janitorial and eco-friendly cleaning supplies, disposable food service items, and shipping boxes and supplies. Discover why many local businesses, schools, and people purchase from Coast Paper and Supply. Well, it's because of their excellent customer service with a smile. 
you can find Coast Paper and Supply at 151 Josephine Street in Santa Cruz, open weekdays 8 to 4.30, or you can give them a call at 831-423-3350. That's Coast Paper and Supply, a proud member of Think Local First. Local First Radio Show supports our locally owned businesses and governments each week to tell their own story, Saturdays from 2 to 3 p.m. Think Local First is sponsored by Tremonti's Italian Restaurant, located in the Seabride area, and Kiss by an Angel Wines, located in Scotts Valley. Come join Cami Corvin and her hosts each week, Saturday from 2 to 3 on KSCO AM 1080 or KSCO.com. Think Local First, it's the only way to go. Do you ever wonder if you can know the truth? Jesus said you can know the truth and the truth will set you free. So dwell on truth with us. Sunday at 11 a.m. I'm Daniel Bodwin. And I'm Brenton Powers. We're Christians and missionaries. And we'll be answering your commonly asked questions from the Bible about God and humanity and salvation. So join us for the Dwell on Truth show every Sunday from 11 a.m. to noon here on KSCO. Uh-oh. China Watch Radio is brought to you in oh, part yeah? by Sushi Market Sprouts on 7th in Santa Cruz and Kaito in the Capitola Mall Food Court. Treat yourself to the finest Japanese cuisine you'll find anywhere with fresh sushi to go and delicious ramen dinners. Sushi Market Sprouts and Kaito. Yum! Uh-oh, Brad's buzzed. Oh, yeah? Yeah, he's starting with the woots. <laughs> The good thing is, he knows when he's buzzed. Know your buzzed warning signs? Call for a ride when it's time to go home. Buzz driving is drunk driving. A message from NHTSA and the Ad Council. Well, that's our program for today. I want to thank uh, John T. Collier, Michael Olson, and you for listening to our program. We'll uh, hit the ground running next week at this same time. That's 2 o'clock Thursday, 2 to 4, right here on KSCO. And just a reminder, we have uh, Flight 1080 on the way in just a moment. We invite you to stick around. They are warming up the airplane and getting the show ready to go. We invite you to stick around for that and some national news at the top of the hour. This is AM 1080 KSCO Santa Cruz.